morning, sweet friends. I want you all to, everybody at one time, take yourselves off mute and say good morning and hi to Mr. Josh and Mr. Olivia here. Hi. Hi. Special guests. Hi. Morning. Hi. Okay, after you've said a nice, friendly good morning, put yourselves back on mute. And some of you, I don't know your faces, so welcome to the other special guests um, who are joining us to hear Mr. Irby talk about his very exciting life over at SpaceX. So I'm gonna first turn it over to Mr. Josh up here, who is with Flex, of course, and he's gonna say a few words before he turns it over to Mr. Herb. All right, take it away. All right, Eileen, thank you for getting our ship prepped for this event. Um, we're all very excited to have Mr. Irby here. I think the main difference between all the kids and me is that I don't know anything about space, but I'm super excited to learn from Mr. Irby and super excited to learn along with you guys. Um, so kind of the format we're gonna have here so everybody knows is that um, first we're gonna get to know Mr. Irby, talk about how he got here because um, we'll find out when he was three years old, he knew what he wanted to do. Um, and then as we uh, move into a portion of this program where Mr. Irby is going to talk about what he does at SpaceX. And then we will have questions from you guys. And then finally, I know everybody's going to try and show off what you guys have been doing all week. Right, Eileen? That's right. Um, those of you, I know some are very eager to show our space engineer the uh, modules we've been working on. So hold on to them, put them to the side, but I will give you time at the end to share with them. And, and, uh, and I know that Mr. Irby makes, makes systems work and you guys had to make this paper cup work to keep your astronauts safe. So we will have time at the end for that. Okay. Well, I'm very excited to see this. Excellent, Andrew. So Andrew, Andrew and I have had a chance to talk a little bit. I've also had a chance to talk with some other people as well about Mr. Irby. Um, and the uh, most interesting, one of the most interesting things that Mr. Irby told me about that I think is, is most relevant to the kids here is that Mr. Irby knew when he was three years old, when he was shooting rockets off, that this is what he wanted to do. Is that a true statement, Mr. Irby? And welcome. Thank you. Um, you know, that's, that's pretty much true. I've, I've, uh, I've known for most of my life what I wanted to do um, and that it generally would relate to space stuff. I knew that I was very, very interested in rockets and space flight in one way or another since I was uh, little, yeah, probably maybe three or so. Um, you know, not everyone knows for sure what they want to be when they grow up. I'm a lucky one who did, but uh, uh, yeah, so. I knew I wanted to do something with rockets or space or something like that. So maybe be an astronaut or an astronomer or something. Um, and then I found out in school that I ended up being good at math. That was just something that came easily to me. And, um, and math and physics and that kind of thing that lends itself to being an engineer. And so I decided uh, when, when I was in maybe high school or so that I probably wanted to be an engineer. Um, uh, an aerospace engineer, which is which is the type of engineer that I am now. Uh, so someone who works on rockets or planes and basically uh, does something in in the space of designing or building or operating uh, a plane or a rocket. So I'm I'm on the design, build, operate the spaceship side of things now. Uh, but before we get to the actual spaceships, you were kind of born into this as we discussed it's kind of in your genes but that doesn't mean that everybody you work with at spacex uh has parents who were also engineers right talk about that that's totally right so um yeah i i guess i definitely have uh engineering genes in my family kind of my both of my parents have engineering uh education backgrounds and my grandpa was an engineer too uh but um 
I work with such a large variety of people that come from different backgrounds. Uh, you know, uh, you know, they're the first, uh, say, engineers in their family, or even first college-educated people in their family, and some of them came from totally different backgrounds than aerospace engineering um, when they uh, when they came to SpaceX and started to work on our rockets. Um, mostly from a uh, either a, a physics or automotive engineering or environmental engineering, that type of thing, uh, that background. So they're all strong in math, but uh, all the engineers that I work with at least, but all of them came from very different backgrounds. So I think you can kind of get into something like this from a variety of different paths. All right, um, and, and even though um, this, you were kind of born into this. You were fantastic at math and science to the point that your mom told me uh, that you were a little bit bored at times in math and science because you got it. Um, you were also very well-rounded. We can also see that you've got some instruments there. So yeah. talk about uh, your, your illustrious career in track and field. Um, maybe not so illustrious. You <laughs> clearly love some guitars there. So being well-rounded is important as well. Um, yeah, so I would say one one thing that that did help um, both career-wise and is just a generally good thing to to do, uh, for, or was a good thing for me growing up was kind of um, in addition to kind of focusing a lot on uh, my classes and stuff, and uh, you know on what I would want to do as a career. I definitely made made sure to try to be well-rounded as a person. So um, like you said, I, I ran track and field. I'm not the most coordinated person, so I can run though. Um, Your mom would agree with you. <laughs> maintain some sort of athletic type of thing. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I took up a bunch of hobbies. Um, I'm not particularly great at guitar, but I'm actually learning uh, piano right now. Um, nice. And uh, I love, uh, doing all sorts of outdoor stuff, backpacking, camping, uh, skiing, that kind of thing. So uh, I think there's definitely, it's definitely important to both, uh, you know, um, stay, stay focused in school and, and take that seriously, but also um, take up things outside of it. Um, and and, and uh, on, on the academic side, if you're bored, you know, push yourself, you know, uh, figure out what else you can do to, to learn and, and make yourself better. Yeah, that, and that's something that, that I think uh, it sounded like you did, is you did a lot of learning about rockets and space outside of school. I heard, I heard about the Boy Scouts, I heard about Bill Nye, you know. So what, what was that all about, kind of keeping yourself entertained outside of school, chasing your dream? Right, so I, I loved playing with model rockets uh, primarily, and uh, so I would I would build a bunch of those, a bunch of balsa wood airplanes, uh, uh, remote controlled airplanes, that type of thing. So there's I there's definitely a lot of hobby hobby stuff that is fun, and you can keep yourself entertained with and learn learn lots of things about how to build. Um, and, and the physics of rockets from, from making your own hobby rockets or, or um, and maybe balsa wood gliders, that type of thing. Um, obviously the rockets, you know, uh, have your parents help you with those, but um, uh, yeah, that, and there's, there's a, a wealth of other, other places that you can, can learn about, uh, any, any type of hobby like this, but for me, it was rockets. So um, rockets and science related stuff. So Bill Nye was, was one of my favorite shows growing up. Um, there's, some, there's some great science programming on now, and I'm sure on YouTube now, there's some, some great things that you can learn. Um, t tons of channels there that are probably even more readily accessible than a TV show. You guys might not know what a TV show is at this point. So who knows? Um, so let's let's fast forward to college and Georgia Tech. Uh, did you kind of know that that's where you wanted to go to college as well? And talk about your college experience because um, sounds like you were very, 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 very focused. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so I kind of knew fairly early on I wanted to go there. Uh, I was probably a little biased because both of my parents went to Georgia Tech and I lived in Georgia and it's a pretty good school there for engineering. So um, yeah, that was uh, I, that was like a pretty uh, sure bet for me and I ended up there. Um, uh, uh, an engineering degree is pretty challenging to get in general. Um, it's it, it can definitely require a lot of focus. And so um, that was definitely a, an experience that was a challenge to me, um, but it, it's definitely it's definitely worth it. Um, I learned a ton um, and uh, just kind of uh, made sure to actually get the most out of the experience. It's, it's really important to actually um, take the courses seriously and think about where you, you might actually be applying the material. Uh, there's definitely a lot that I learned in college that I thought, well, maybe, you know, will I use this piece of knowledge? And at work, it ends up being actually very useful. <laughs> well, now, so now we're at work. And instead of me asking questions about what you do and you have to cover knots. we have to know what a knot is. Yes. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, we've good. got, you know, so about 10 minutes of you talking. Um, and obviously in that 10 minutes, you gotta tell us what you do, who you support, Bob and Doug who are up in space right now because of what you did. And again, knots. please tell us about knots. So it's all okay. yours. I will gladly tell just, you about masternodes. Can I just jump in here for one second before you start? If you have a question, can you just hold it? Because we're going to hear Mr. Irby's going to show you some awesome pictures and tell you some things for a few minutes. And then we will take uh, your question. So Finn, I know I see your hand down there, but let's hear Mr. Irby's presentation and then we'll, then we'll take questions. All right. I'll go ahead and click screen share. Uh, and oh, okay. Here we go. Are you doing that on your end, Josh? Okay. You are Perfect. now closed. All right. Uh, we'll together, Andrew. This is awesome. All right. Um, okay, so uh, I'll really quick background. So I'm an engineer at SpaceX. Um, this is the, the building I work in. You got a cool rocket out front. Um, you all can see this, right? Yes. Cool. Okay. Thumbs up. thumbs up if you can see it. Thumbs up, guys. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm giving some thumbs up. Excellent. Um, so this is in Los Angeles, California. Um, uh, so I'm an engineer at SpaceX. We, the whole company builds rockets, uh, space capsules and satellites. And we, we launch them and their payloads into space. So um, I work at SpaceX as a life support system engineer. So uh, I'm going to jump to the next slide here. Uh, actually, I'm going to go, here we go. Um, I'm a life support engineer on our um, Dragon space capsule. So, um, so this is, I don't know exactly what you all have learned about uh, space capsules and landers. It looks like you've built landers of your own. But this is a uh, this is a space capsule that flies in space and takes uh, people to the International Space Station, which is orbiting around Earth um, in low Earth orbit right now. Um, so uh, th this space capsule has a volume of air inside of it, and so we can carry people or cargo or even mice. So. Most recently, we launched this capsule to the International Space Station with Bob and Doug in it, uh, two astronauts. Um, we, we did that just about a, lo a little under a month ago. Uh, and they are up on the space station right now. Um, so that's, that's pretty exciting. That was a, a super exciting uh, mission to fly. And they'll be coming back in maybe August, we think. Um, they're doing like space walks and stuff on the space station right now. So they flew up in um, the Dragon space capsule, which I have a picture of here docking with the space station. Um, I, I worked on this capsule in that I d 
designed part of designed and figured out how to build and operate part of the life support system. So you think about uh, these these astronauts are inside of the capsule uh, with inside of a volume of air uh, protected from space, which has pretty much nothing in it. You can't breathe in space. So they're inside of the space capsule and uh, we have to make sure that the air that they're breathing is it's okay to breathe and that they have enough oxygen. We scrub the carbon dioxide out of the air. We control the temperature and the humidity of the air um, and, and make sure it's a nice environment for the crew to, to, to live in while they're on their way to the space station. It took them uh, about 19 hours to go from, from launch to the space station for this mission, but they uh, we've designed it so that they can be in space for a few days before they get to the space station. So it's kind of a space taxi. So I got to, for the life support system, for some of the, for some of the subsystems, I got to actually design from the ground up, um, test, test the system and make sure that it does what it needs to do and will survive all of the space environments, keep up with the, the crew, uh, their metabolic load of breathing in oxygen, breathing out carbon dioxide and water and all this stuff. And then uh, put it onto the space capsule and um, figure out how to operate it and uh, then help make sure that it was operating correctly during our launch. We're going to be launching a a bunch more of these capsules with astronauts in them pretty regularly to the space station in the upcoming years. Now, what we what we got to do to kind of uh, test this out, all of our, our life support systems and everything like that, was um, in some earlier missions on a previous model of this space capsule, we got to fly mice um, with, a, which, uh, with a much tinier little life support system that would keep the mice alive in their little tiny enclosure in, in a cargo capsule. So we, we launched, um, sometime, on some missions we launched a good 40 mousetronauts, little mice in, a, in an enclosure where they had water and food and stuff and um, sent them up to the International Space Station um, as a science payload. So we got to practice with a, with a bunch of little oxygen tanks and stuff um, for the astronauts. They weren't wearing them. They, they didn't get space suits like Bob and Doug did, but... Um, uh, and do they have names like Bob and Doug? Sorry? Do they have names like Bob and Doug? They might. I don't know their names, though. The mouse. The, they, they didn't tell me what their names were. They don't, they don't speak English, so... Uh, they're... <laughs> um, but... So yeah, we got to send some astronauts up. And then when we built the first version of this latest model of our capsule, the Dragon 2 capsule, um, uh, we, we first sent up a, uh, a, a build of the capsule without any people in it, just to make sure that all of, the, all of the propulsion, the life support systems, everything on the capsule would work um, and, and uh, you know, new, new, would figure out how that would work uh, before we, flew with people. So um, that, that's been over the course of the last six years or so that we went from flying astronauts to the newest model of our capsule to now we, we got to fly people. Um, so Andrew, tell us about the people. Tell us, I mean, we, a lot of us were watching the launch and, and everybody said Bob and Doug were the nicest people in the world. So um, tell us about them and the fact that you're literally protecting their lungs, right? And that must be a lot of weight on your shoulders. That's right. So the, the um, Bob and Doug are two really stand-up guys. I've, um, I've gotten the privilege of, of working a, a little bit with them directly and a, a great deal indirectly with them. And um, they really helped us figure out all of, the, all of the crew interface things in our capsule and our uh, Absolutely stand-up guys, very, very smart, um, very easy to get along with, uh, and they know what they're doing. These guys are the best of the best. Um, 
they're getting to fly our brand new spaceship. So they're pretty happy with that too. You know, everyone, all astronauts want to be the first test pilot on the thing that they get to fly. That's the, that's the dream. So these guys are um, very happy to be flying our capsule and we're super happy that they get to fly with us because these guys are, um, you know, top notch astronauts. Astronauts in general are just, uh, they have to be just absolutely the best. You know, they've got to be very smart they got to be quick thinking, um, able to deal with things, be cool under pressure. So Bob and Doug are, are the pinnacle of that. Um, and so it's very important that uh, our capsule's life support system work very well. So um, we built a ton of redundancy into our life support system so that uh, if, if anything were to break, we've got backup hardware and um, uh, we're so far, we've done a, a great job of controlling the environment so that they've got nice air to breathe. Like you said, their, their lungs are reliant on us. So um, our, our CO2 scrubber has been pulling out carbon dioxide that the crew has been breathing out of the atmosphere. And our oxygen system has been injecting oxygen into the cabin. And we've been controlling it to a nice, nice temperature, uh, giving them nice airflow with the fans. Uh, which you actually have to do in space. When you're inside of a, a closed volume in space, you have to be blowing some sort of blowing air around this volume because you don't get the natural mixing that you do in 1G on Earth. In, in gravity on Earth, you get buoyant convection, like imagine a, like steam rising out of a, a pot of water. You don't get that in space when you're in zero G because there's no, there's not this pull of gravity so you have to have a fan blowing air over over every part of the cabin um so uh, stuff like that we we definitely are uh, that's very, the, very that careful is. about our design and uh uh have have a lot of redundancy built in because we know how important it is and redundancy andrew could be another word practice you talked about practice you talked about um being at mission control for this latest launch, talk about all the emotions, the excitement, the fear, but also that you, you knew you kind of got this because you had practiced so much. And what's that lesson? Yeah, so I, I had the privilege of being the life support specialist in mission control for launch of this mission. Um, so that meant that I was on console in our mission control um, monitoring how the life support system was functioning and uh, making sure everything was working correctly. Um, so uh, in that capacity, I, uh, we, we, we practiced uh, probably, I, I can't even count how many times we've practiced uh, launches, missions, um, and all sorts of anomalies, things that could go wrong and how to fix them in, in simulations of the mission for a good year and a half leading up to this most recent mission. So, Andrew, are we talking a hundred times, a thousand times, 10,000 times? Uh, probably more like a hundred. Uh, you know, Mr. Uh, Irby, when you're practicing and it didn't work, um, how, how did you feel? Do you come up, you talk about redundancy and more ideas. Because our kids can relate to that feeling, making something and it doesn't work. And how, how do you feel when that happens, when you're trying to think of other ideas? Well, I'm going to knock on some wood. So far, our spaceship has worked perfectly. But um, we've, we've practiced for when it doesn't work and have a plan for pretty much every way that it could not work. Um, and on top of that, uh, we have people like myself and my coworkers who built all of the hardware on the capsule who can think quickly on the fly if they need to about how to fix a problem if one were to arise that we hadn't planned for. So uh, I, think, I think when something goes wrong, uh, the, the things to, to, that are important are that you be prepared and that you understand the thing that you have built so that you can figure out how to solve any sort of unexpected problem with it. So we, we definitely put a lot of work into doing that. 
And so when, when I was in mission control for the launch, I was nervous, but I did feel like I, I, I had this, even if anything were to go wrong, we, we had practiced so many times that we, we, we had, we had trained so much. We, we, um, felt very confident that we could solve any sort of problem there. And I certainly felt proud because this has been, I've, I've worked on designing and building this hardware for years, five-ish years leading up to um, this mission. So it's very good to see that all fly. Andrew, I'm glad you were well prepared to send those two men into space, but now we're gonna move into the phase of the, qu the questions coming from the kids, which they've been preparing, which you don't know so let's see how prepared you are for these smart little kids to ask you some questions. So Eileen, you want to take over? Yeah, and I, I, is there a way, Mr. Irby, you could maybe unshare, even though we love seeing the astronauts, then we could see all the faces and the hands, and we could do a little Q&A that way. Yeah, and okay. Then we share it again later. Sounds good. Constantly zoom. There we go. There's all the beautiful faces and all the hands. So let's uh, start up here. Olivia, go ahead and mute yourself. What do you got? Um, I'm going to make it. Um, do you like being an engineer? I do very much like being an engineer. It is a lot of work, um, and it can be stressful sometimes. I very much, very much enjoy being an engineer. Thank you, Olivia. Okay, so good. You muted. These kids know what to do. Love, great comment. And let's come over, Kona. Go ahead, unmute yourself. Did you start working at SpaceX? And how, uh, yeah, and when did you start working at SpaceX? So I started working at SpaceX in 2014. Um, and the whole time that I've been working here, I've been working one way or another on life support stuff. So at first it was on the life support system for the little Maelstronauts. Um, and then uh, a, a little bit later for most of my time at SpaceX, it's been, I've been working on building, designing and building the life support system for our people. So, um, well, I'm liking the background here. Oh, thank you, Kona. Good question. And Great who question. Else? Thomas, one of our older friends up here. Thomas, unmute yourself. Go ahead. How long did it take to figure out the ideas of the shuttle thing? I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't hear uh, some of the question. How long did it take to figure out the ideas of the like spaceship? Oh. Yeah, that's a very good question because um, it took it took a really long time to um, figure out all of the little details of our spaceship. So there have been spaceships before, and and based on the spaceships that have been built in the past, we can learn. Uh, our, our company looked at those and tried to take away lessons learned about what things work in a spaceship design, what things don't work in a spaceship design. And um, then once we had a kind of a very uh, broad picture of what our spaceship would need to look like, um, then we, we started building and testing parts of the spaceship that we thought that we would need and learned from those. And so we went from a kind of a sketch of what the spaceship would need to look like this particular spaceship would need to look like back in uh, 2013 or so to um, a fully built spaceship um, a little earlier this year for, for this particular one. And, and then we're going to build a bunch of the same spaceship um, so that we have kind of a space taxi service in the space station. So, nice, thank you, Thomas. Good question. I really like that question. Yeah, and we have a couple hands here, and I know, Finn, is your hand up? You had a couple questions about how the astronauts eat food or if they get scared. Where's Finn? Do you want to ask that question now? I forgot. Sorry. You forgot. Oh, okay. Well, I remembered. You kind of asked about food because I, I know I had that question too. How do they eat food? Because doesn't it just fly everywhere? 
So they need a system for eating different than we do. Yes, so that's actually a very good question and a very good point. Um, eating and drinking in zero gravity, like being in space, it is actually not an easy thing to do, at least with food that you would have on Earth. So like you said, the food will go flying around if you have something that can do that. So imagine eating a piece of bread that, is, that makes a lot of crumbs when you bite into it. Those crumbs will just go flying everywhere and get all over, the, all over your capsule or space station. So um, astronauts usually choose food um, that is easy to eat in space and doesn't make a mess. So it's usually stuff that sticks together. Um, uh, so for instance, for bread, instead of using a baguette or something or a loaf of bread, they'll eat tortillas because tortillas, um, uh, wheat tortillas, um, will stick together and don't really make a lot of crumbs. And they also pack nicely into tiny packages so you can fit a lot of them on top of a rocket. So um, usually food that's uh, kind of sticky to itself and doesn't go flying around and make crumbs. And then for drinking water, for instance, imagine you have a cup of water and zero G turning it upside down does nothing because you're still floating around in no gravity. So instead, imagine like a Capri Sun pouch. They pretty much have Capri Sun pouches for all of their, all of their water and any other things that they're drinking up in space. They can just squeeze the liquid out through a straw and drink it. Wow. Andrew. Wow. Thank you, Finn. I mean, thank you yesterday for bringing that up because that's so interesting to learn. Go ahead, Andrew, John. Andrew, we have a, a special guest, Sheena Kawasaki, who's got some special socks in back of her. You might know her. Can you introduce yourself, Sheena? I'm actually Andrew's mom, and my name is not Sheena. <laughs> And my question for Andrew is, can you tell us about the rituals you have before you do your launch? Oh, okay, certainly. And uh, thank you, Sheena. Um, Mom. <laughs> the, uh, so your, your background alludes to one of my rituals, which is I have a lucky pair of socks that I have worn for uh, all of our dragon launches of our dragon capsule. Um, with, with, with rockets, they're, they're rocket socks. Um, and I dare not wear a different pair of socks on launch day because, you know, maybe I'm not superstitious, but it can't ha hurt to have luck on your side. Um, and I also have a, a lucky t-shirt that I wear for, for our launches. So um, very important to have a, a ritual. I'm joking, it's, it's not actually very important to have, have lucky clothes for a launch, but uh, I figure it can't hurt. It makes you feel good, right? It makes you feel good. Yes. <laughs> well, we are lucky to have had you, Andrew. And uh, I think now the luck is on your side because these kids are going to show you some of what they've done, right? Yeah. And um, I know there was like one or two hands left, but do, if you would like, and you do not have to share, uh, um, of course, as always, but if you would like to share um, what you made, and we want to give everybody a turn, um, then put your hand up. Um, and even if you're someone who had a question while you're sharing, you could maybe ask that question too. But we have a lot of excitement in the room here. So Nirvan, how about over to you? Go ahead, unmute yourself. Show them what you got. And so I have something to share and I have like three questions. And so, my, and so I'm gonna ask my questions first. And so my first question is, what are the suits made of? So our space suits are made of a few layers of different materials. Um, there's an inner layer that is to hold in the air pressure. So if the space suit, if the capsule were to depressurize, the space suit would still hold in air. So that's a bladder layer. And then on the outside is a, uh, kind of a, a layer to protect the, the bladder against wear and to kind of hold its shape. And these are all made of some fire resistant materials so that the, the crew is protected from any sort of uh, problems that could happen in the spaceship. My space dust? Space Sorry? dust like that? Like a sponsor, sponsor proof? Yes, we, we, make, make, we try to make our spacesuits so that it's, it's hard to damage them as well. Nirvan, hold up what you have there. 
And so this is like my toy, like a Lego rocket that I built. And so it's kind of like the dragon, but instead of like a more pointy top, it has like a round curve. That's excellent. And, and just look and see, it's just like a dragon. It drops these the rocket capsules. And then the last one that's left is this. And then this part is the part that lands and the O's that lands, but these parts still get to be used again. Excellent. So yeah, that's right. That's very much like a rocket and uh, that you have, you have the stages pop apart and uh, only, only the top part um, flies in space and comes back. And my second question is, does the part that are the parts that fall off dragon, do they still get reused or do they get thrown away? Because I thought dragon was a reusable rocket. So parts of dragon are reusable. Um, if, if you look at a rocket, uh, the rocket that we launched the capsule on, the first part of the rocket is actually reusable. So that bottom part flies back and lands on the ground. And then we, we uh, fuel it back up and put another spaceship on top of it. Um, but the back part of the capsule called the trunk, which has our solar arrays and uh, radiator and can carry other cargo, um, we, we do throw that one away before coming back to Earth. And that's just because it's very hard to protect something like a space capsule from all of the, the heat from coming back to Earth. Nice. Good question, Nirvana. I'm gonna, we're going to share because I want to give other people a chance. So thank you so much. You always have such great questions. Um, I also want to say Nirvana had a, his lunar paper cup had moving parts to it yesterday. But oh, he's wow. excited about what he built with the Legos, and I just love that too. How about Yana? You had your hand up, honey. Do you want to ask a question or show Mr. Irby what you made? Um, I have a question. Um... Which college did you go to? Uh, so I went to Georgia Tech, um, which is an engineering college. But there are there are many engineering colleges that are that are comparable to, to Georgia Tech, and that you can get an engineering degree and go into aerospace engineering or any sort of engineering from. I work with people from all sorts of colleges. Thank you, Yana. Great question. And um, hands up over here. Now, who didn't get a chance? Kona, go ahead. Now, Roland, I think you had a question too. So let's do Kona and then Roland. Go ahead, Kona, unmute yourself. Um, I mean, this galaxy. Awesome. Go ahead. Yes. And what colors did you use to make your galaxy? Blue, dark. Blue and green. Dark blue. Mr. Irby, we made these galaxy jars because we were trying to copy the images that come back from the Hubble telescope oh. of galaxies. They're very colorful. They're very swirly. And uh, we did a lot of things this week, and that's one of them. So, so this, this galaxy jar you have, is it, is it swirly like the Milky Way, or is it, is it like a different galaxy? Or uh, tell me about it, Kona. Different galaxy? Which, which galaxy do you think it looks like? Just, just one of them. We were also encouraged to name our own galaxies because I don't think, uh, we didn't think that they were all named yet. So, yeah. so named their own probably names. not. I don't know the name of most of them. <laughs> Kona, thank you for thank showing you. that. And Roland, did you have a question or does anyone want to show the paper landers or show the experiment? We've been dropping them all week and they either work or don't. Mine has ha, is almost working. But Roland, why don't you show your lunar lander? Did you want to do that? Nope. Who, who wants to drop their paper lander and show oh, it? Yeah. Oh, oh, Henry. Henry, I love seeing your hand. Unmute yourself, hon. Um, I made this. Oh, wow. And I can drop it. And it, if it how if it's an emergency, sometimes they can, the balloon can fly off with my Lego figure attached to it. Oh, so you built the, the balloon just fell out, and 
and the Lego figures were attached to tape, so now they're safe. Oh, so you built a safety system like that, huh? Backup. Mm -hmm. I like that. That's a very good idea. Great. Henry, thank you for showing that, because we know that your job is to keep the astronauts safe, and that's what we've been doing. Uh, you know, if astronauts spill out of the of the of the vehicle, it's it's just not good for anyone. No, so we really they've come up with so many ideas over and over. Just like you, you have backup ideas. And uh, one of our who who was it yesterday that I freaked out at because you had five ideas in case your first one didn't work. And I said that's an engineer's brain. I think you all have engineers' brain, but right, Mr. Irby, like he got five more ideas in case that didn't work. I think that was me. Was that was that you, Nirvan? I bet that was you also. Yeah, I I, I think that was uh, cause I'm because when I grow up, I want to work for SpaceX. I not just be an astronaut. I want to be an astronaut that goes to the International Space Station and even an engineer for SpaceX to actually get them safe home. And they, I'm actually going to build the whole rocket and try. The whole rocket come down to Earth. Nirvan, you're totally going to do that, I think. You are so going to do it. I see a hand up here. Alex, go ahead, unmute yourself. Ask uh, Mr. Irby your question. You ask. Hey, Mr. Irby. I think we recognize you from some yeah. of the broadcasts, actually. Oh. <laughs> but, um, so it's a pleasure to talk to you. But uh, uh, our question is, is how different does it look uh, in space I want uh, at, at, at nighttime? <laughs> Uh, compared to Earth at nighttime, because when we were in the mountains a long time ago, you could see a ton of stars, which we can't near DC. So I will I will speak from secondhand knowledge because I've never been in space, but I hear that the stars are even better than the clearest night on Earth, um, and just because there's just no atmosphere in your way, you can just see everything at night in space. You can see stars that you would never see on Earth, um, and that it's absolutely stunningly beautiful. And then when you look back at Earth, uh, you can you can see some lights on the ground on Earth, and you know it's from a perspective that you just normally wouldn't. So I hear it's it's really pretty. Um, Andrew, I got a question. Yeah. Sure. I know based on our conversations that you this was your biggest accomplishment yet. And that's fantastic. Um, but do you want to go to space? I think I would like to go to space for maybe a few days um, and uh, just check it out, you know, see those stars and Earth from from way up in space and float around some. But uh, I really like Earth. Earth is a really nice place. Uh, it's got my favorite food and uh, atmosphere. And my mom, my family, my friends, all on Earth. So space is fun and all, but it seems like something that I would personally want to only do for a few days. But there are lots of people out there who want to explore space and find that exciting. And I think that is really exciting and really cool. Um, I think that's, that's kind of our future. Nice. Thank you, Mr. Josh. Good question. Uh, Olivia has another question. Unmute yourself, bud. Go ahead. And, and in the future, you might go to Mars. Yes. What do astronauts know. think of space? What do astronauts think of space? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, so, of course, they're excited to go to space. Um, and that's what their job is. So they definitely are very happy to do that. But living in space is uh, kind of like camping. They've described it. I've heard astronauts describe being in space uh, kind of like camping because you are you're eating you're eating food that you normally wouldn't eat. It's kind of like camping food sometimes, depending on what camping food you bring camping. Um, the the places they sleep in they sleep in sleeping bags usually in the space station um, because there's not there's not really a point of sleeping in a bed because you're just floating around. So they they kind of get in a sleeping bag and strap themselves to the wall in a little kind of uh, thing to keep the light out in the space station. So, and, and a few other aspects of life up in space are kind of, kind of like camping. So uh, 
it's kind of like a big camping trip that the astronauts get to go on. But I have another question. Sorry? Have you ever done any anti-gravity tests? Ooh, Ooh, I like that question too. I have not personally done anti-gravity tests, but um, some, some people that I work with have done testing where they get in an airplane that is specially made for this. And the airplane flies in such a way that for maybe 30 seconds or so, they are weightless and get to do zero gravity testing experiments. That's uh, really cool. Yeah, it's very exciting. I want to do that one day. Nice. Oh, good, good question, Olivia. Um, Mr. Irby, I just have a, a follow up of what you were saying about camping. Um, I, I'm in a scout family. My son just became an Eagle Scout. So there's been lots of camping, at least in my family. Can I see a thumbs up from anybody who's gone camping, even if you were camping in your backyard, if you belong to a program, or you camp with the cushions on your couch, give me a thumbs up if you ever did camping. Um, and you can do it, you know, in your backyard with the sleeping bag. So that's excellent. Miss Irby, we have a lot of campers here too. So maybe the next time they go camping, they can imagine, close their eyes, that they are actually on, on uh, in outer space if that's what it feels like a little bit, we could relate to that. Yeah. Good, good campers. Nice. So, uh, Mr. Josh, I'm going to throw it back to you um, because we've covered so many questions. Would you like to, to say something? We are nearly at the end of our hour, and I think I, right. I, think I could be here all day talking to Mr. Irby. So interesting. Especially with all the, the mouses. Wow. We could all be here all day, but Mr. Irby has work. He's on the West Coast, and he's got to get into work. So I think we all just want to say, however you and our friends say thank you to our guest. Uh, but Mr. Irby, I will just tell you thank you for taking the time. Thank you to my friend Donna for connecting me uh, with your mom and making this happen. We really appreciate it. It was a perfect end um, to our space week. So we really do appreciate it. And I reiterate that. It's very nice to meet you, Mr. Irby. You're very inspiring to, to talk to, and it's really been a pleasure. So here's how we say goodbye. I want everybody to take yourself off mute and wave and say goodbye to Mr. Irby and thank you. Bye. 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 Have a great time. It was great talking to you. I really had a great time.